And it's this, there's an article in the current issue of the Claremont Review of Books. Claremont is a collection of colleges in Southern California. It's just down the street from where my in-laws have lived. And, um, you know, it's an intellectual community. There's an article there in the lower right-hand corner, and I've here on the other side, it's by David Gallertner. He's a professor of computer science at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, and it's called Giving Up Darwin, or Up from Darwinism. Darwinism. And in the article, he essentially says, Darwin is, I'll probably overstate it, Darwin is totally bankrupt, devoid of any support or reason. It does not work. This ought to give great courage to people to speak boldly about this. I'm going to play 10 minutes of clips from the interview that he did with uh, David Berlinski, another professor who's written against Darwinism, and Stephen Meyer uh, from the Discovery Institute. So here is Hoover Institution. This was just released, I think, this week, uh, talking about Darwin. By the, by the early 2000s, there have been a number of different experimental measures of the rarity of the functional genes and proteins versus all the gibberish sequences. Right. And for a short, for, for example, just one result, for a short protein 150 amino acids long, the ratio is one uh, protein that will fold into a, a functional structure for, uh, c compared to 10 to the 77th gibberish sequences. So the ratio of functional to non-functional is 1 over 10 to the 77th power. Okay, so functioning proteins are extremely rare. It's very hard to imagine random mutations leading to functional proteins, except that, and here I quote Dr. Galarenter again, but the theory understands that mutations are rare, and successful ones even scarcer. Darwinism knows this. To balance that out, there are many organisms and a staggering immensity of time. Your chances of winning might be infinitesimal, but if you play the game often enough, you win in the end. Correct? That's the and theory. And that's the question. Do you play it often enough? There's always an often enough, and the question is, does the history of life with which Darwin was concerned uh, allow you enough chances to make it uh, at all probable, let's say, or even possible that you'll hit on, one, statistically, that you'll hit on one of those amazingly rare necklaces that folds up into a protein that can be stuck in a cell and actually doing, doing anything. I'm not a biologist, and so I look at this and say, yeah, there ain't, sure there's enough time. You know, there, there's been a lot of creatures on Earth, and life has gone on for a long time, but when biologists look at this and try and nail it down and figure it out, try and make a guess, try and use heuristics to make a guess, like using the, the number of total bacterial lifetime as a measure of the number of total mutations we're playing with, the point is, from whatever angle you come at it, the, the answer is no, there has not been enough time. The, the, the number of throws we've had is p too puny even to talk about. It doesn't even approach puniness David. and certainly is nowhere near reasonable. So, so we would get that if we had a reasonable no uh, time, but we don't. We didn't. We haven't. So let me just be very explicit for my little Winnie the Pooh bear-sized mind. You are, saying, <laughs> you are saying that Darwin is unlikely to, have, to be able, it's unlikely that species arose the way Darwin said or you are saying it is impossible. Darwin was just mystic. Lovely man, beautiful idea. There's hardly a difference. <laughs> There's hardly a difference. Unlikely, impossible. We're talking about odds that are so prohibitive. If you wish to say it's impossible, fine. I'll defend you saying it's impossible. If you wish to say it's highly unlikely, I'll be in your corner as defense attorney as well. But there's no practical difference. It's look like we've known it about just these didn't things for way. hundreds of years. Right? You get a million monkeys at a million typewriters, all of them typing at random. We know they're not going to produce the collected works of Shakespeare in anything like a reasonable amount of time. It's like that wonderful episode of The Simpsons. Do you remember it? Mr. Burns has a million monkeys typing at a million typewriters. <laughs> 
they're going to produce the greatest novel ever written. He pulls out one sheet of paper and says, it was the best of times, it was the blurst of times. <laughs> it was the best of times, it was the blurst of times, you stupid monkey. <laughs> stupid monkey. <laughs> or to, to put the discussion down even lower, the Jim Carrey film, where he's... Uh, uh, trying to get a date with a, a young lady he fancies and she tells him to go away. He says, well, what are the, what are the odds a, a, a girl like me and a guy like you could get together? No, not good. And he says, what do you mean, not good? Well, like one in a hundred? And she says, like one in a million. And then he says, well, but if there's a chance. <laughs> you know, you know. So you're telling me there's a chance. <sighs> yeah! <laughs> I read you. Here's a precise way of, uh, of, yes. of, of uh, cashing out this probabilistic argument. If you have 1 over 10 to the 77th <laughs> power is your ratio, but then you have all, if every organism in the history of the planet, and we can estimate that, about 10 to the 40th organisms. So you define Bacteria, little bac tiny things, and, yeah, everything. And, every and mosquito, every, time one of those, every bacterium. Yeah, every time one of those uh, replicates, there's a possibility for a mutation that could search right. the space of possibilities. So you got 10 to the 40th possible mutations against a, a search space 10 to the 77th strong. Right. So if you do your exponential math, you end up with, you can, what it means is you can search one ten trillion trillionth, one ten trillion trillion trillionth of the possible combinations. So in that case, are you more likely to succeed or fail? You're overwhelmingly more likely to fail to find one of the functional combinations uh, even taking into account every organism that's lived on Earth. And what he goes on to say is that the, the chance that this, this one string of proteins comes together is 1 in 10 to the 77th power. But the number of organisms that have lived in all of human history is 10 to the 40th. There's a big gap there. I think every science class should play this video and deal with it. Now, David Gelertner uh, is going to talk a little bit about sort of the reaction that he's gotten to his article. Y you can imagine what's happening to him, what's happened to Stephen Meyer and David Berlinski over the years. They are pariah in the world of science. And you thought science was based on fact. It's interesting you get theological and mathematical probability truth from The Simpsons and Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> but it's true. So here's David Gelertner uh, talking about some of the reaction in Darwin and that sort of thing. I, I, I have no theological argument with, with Steve. What I, my argument is with people who dismiss uh, intelligent design without considering it, it seems to me, it's widely dismissed in my world of academia as some sort of theological put-up job. It's an absolutely serious scientific argument. In fact, it's the first and most obvious and intuitive one that comes to mind. It's got to be dealt with intellectually, not, not by the bigotry, the anti-religious bigotry, which is one of the most important facts of the intellectual world in the United States, the West generally. The, 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 case, you know, the case for intelligent design is not based on, uh, you know, we, we can have a theological discussion as we've had a bit here, but the case for intelligent design isn't a, an interpretation or a deduction from the scriptural text. Right. It's an inference from biological evidence. And, right. and in, that, in that sense, it's different. And and he makes the, that assertion, and you say, yep, he's being honest about that. And anybody can check Not only that, but I think it's an important assertion because uh, outside the scientific world, one might not know how ideologically uh, bent the world of science, parts of the world of science are becoming. I, I say it with real sorrow, and it's certainly not true of every scientist or even of most scientists, but we have a cautionary tale in what happened to our English departments and our history departments. It could happen to us. All right, God you're, you're setting up my, 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 sort of my last round of questions here. I'm going to quote you once again, David Gelerentner. Darwinism is no longer just a scientific theory, but the basis of a world view and an emergency religion for the many troubled souls who need one, close quote. Now, lots of people have invested lots of energy in discrediting 
Dr. Berlinski and Dr. Meyer over the years. You, Dr. Galerner, are a professor of unquestioned competence and achievement in computer science. And computer science is with it, baby. It is right at the middle of the new world we're creating. It's technocracy. We don't have to ask ultimate questions. We just have to deal with zeros and ones. It's totally rational. It's producing a cornucopia of new wealth. And now Galerner goes over to the other side. <laughs> He's so, been with us all along. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what's the reception been, been Trader. at New Haven and, and in your profession, in academia? I mean, that's uh, a serious question. What's going on? Yeah, yeah, okay. I, um, I have to make a distinction between the, the way I've been treated personally, which is in a very courteous and collegial way by my colleagues at Yale. They're nice guys, and I like them. They're, they're my friends. On the other hand, when I look at, at their intellectual behavior, what they publish, and much more important, what they tell their students, um, Darwinism has indeed passed beyond a scientific argument as far as they are concerned. You take your life in your hands to challenge it intellectually. Yes. They will destroy you if you challenge it. Now, I haven't been destroyed. I'm not a biologist, and you know, I don't claim to be an authority on this topic. But, um, and you know, a book review is not the same as a book. It's, to, it's to sort of a satellite around the book. But anyway, it remains the case that I have nothing personally to charge my colleagues with. But what I've seen in their behavior intellectually and at colleges across the West is nothing approaching free speech on this topic, is a bitter rejection, not just a, a, a sort of a bitter, fundamental, uh, angry, outraged, violent rejection, which comes nowhere near scientific or intellectual discussion. I've seen that happen again and again. I'm a Darwinism. Don't you say a word against it, or will, or I don't want to hear you. Period. Well, what they will do is they will destroy you. But do you wonder? Do you see what's going on here? This, is, this has become a religion. I've talked to you about leftism as a religion. And it's all tied up. And you, you saw this this week in some of the debates, if you could stomach watching them for more than five minutes. There, there is a worldview behind this. And they, in one of the discussions they have here is he talks about sort of the intellectual basis, Darwin, came along and he gave the materialistic worldview some scientific credibility, street cred. And then Marx came along and did the same thing with politics and, and economics. And Freud came along and did it with psychology. And uh, the host, I can't remember his name right now, he, he goes on and he says, <clears throat> all of them have collapsed, but they're still pushed and believed. <laughs> It's because at the core of this is a religious theological battle against the God of the Bible and his word. That's what's going on. And even though this collapses, they cling to it like grim death. And it is exactly what happened in what's talked about in Psalm chapter 2, written 2,500 years ago, why do the heathen rage? Why do you see these attacks on marriage, on biological sex, on creation, on Israel? All of these have a common core rage against the God of the Bible. It's very significant. As I said, I think this should be certainly in Christian high schools. This interview and this article that Dr. Gerlertner wrote should be spoken. And so here's Stephen uh, Meyer kind of wrapping up a little bit about the collapse of Darwinism. I think you're onto something to, to group them together because uh, you talked about how Darwinism, David talked about how Darwinism has become the foundation of a worldview. And if you yes. look at the questions that they address, uh, Marx, uh, Darwin tells us where we came from. Uh, Marx has a utopian vision of the future and Freud tells us what to do about our guilt. And between the three of these great materialistic thinkers of the 19th century and early 20th century, they form a, the basis of a kind of comprehensive materialistic worldview. They answer all the same questions that traditional Judeo-Christian religion has addressed. 
And so it's uh, understandable when we're talking about some of the, the uh, intense opposition that uh, Darwin skeptics often face, that it, it, it's understandable when you realize that you actually, are, it makes sense because you're challenging a fundamental plank in the worldview of, of many of the scientists. Many scientists equate their worldview of scientific materialism with the practice of science itself. And when you challenge one of the thinkers that, is, that supports that worldview, you're going to get a, a, a very kind of emotive reaction, and that's often what happens. And this is true. Uh, this is, uh, as I said, I think this is a very important video. Highly recommend you go to the Hoover Institution YouTube channel and watch it.